The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's the official name for what is otherwise known as the Mormon Church. Most people associate Mormons with missionaries on bikes, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, and polygamy. Of course, that's not the whole story. The Mormons are a peculiar people, with a unique set of beliefs and quite a history. Meet Mitt Romney. Romney is a Mormon Republican who'd like to be the next president. People are asking the question, will his religion affect whether or not evangelicals vote for him? That's a good question. But to many of us evangelical Christians in Utah who witness to Mormons, we think there are more important questions. Will this be an opportunity for the public to learn about what Mormonism really teaches? Will the doctrines of Mormonism be accurately portrayed? Will people understand the differences between Mormonism and Biblical Christianity? This video is more about Mormonism than it is about Mitt Romney. We'd like to use an interview Romney had on the Charlie Rose Show as a springboard for conversation. But there are some aspects of Mormonism uh, that many Americans might not understand. The belief that uh, Jesus Christ will appear again in the state of Missouri, um, or that God has a material body, that he was fathered by another God. Are these legitimate issues for people to, to, to ask you about? Well, there's a, there's a leap of faith associated with every religion. You, ha you haven't exactly got those doctrines right, but if you have doctrines you want to talk about, go talk to the church, because okay. that's not my job. But uh, the most unusual thing in my church is that we believe there was once a flood upon the earth and that a man took a boat and put two of each animal inside the boat and, and saved humanity by doing that. Th th look, they're unusual. We're familiar uh, with they're, that. They're, they're, un <laughs> they're unusual beliefs associated with each faith, and I'm, I'm proud of, of my faith and happy to talk to people about it. The idea that Adam is going to return uh, to the Valley of Adam on Diamond is very much a part of Mormon doctrine. Mormons also believe, at least it's been taught by Mormon leaders, that Jesus himself will return to Adam on Diamond. This is an area located just north of a town called Gallatin, Missouri, in western Missouri. If you were to go to Gallatin, there's a plaque there that talks about uh, the Mormon belief in, in Adam living in this particular area of the, of the world. Let me just read a, a little section out of Gospel Principles, um, a book that is published by the Mormon Church, has basic simple Mormon doctrine in it, um, the basic things that I think most Mormons believe and most Mormons understand that the church believes. And this is the section on page 268. Near the time of the coming of Jesus, the faithful saints will build a righteous city, a city of God called the New Jerusalem. Jesus Christ himself will rule there. The Lord said the city will, build, it will be built in the state of Missouri in the United States. It's just basic Mormon doctrine. According to Joseph Fielding Smith, the 10th president of the Mormon Church, in his book, uh, Answers to Gospel Questions, he says, The coming of Christ at Adam on Diamond. Daniel speaks of the coming of Christ, and that day is near at hand. There will be a great gathering in the valley of Adam on Diamond. There will be a great council held. The Ancient of Days, who is, Adam's, will, who is Adam, will sit. The judgment, not the final judgment, will be held where the righteous who have held keys will make their reports and deliver up their keys in ministry. Christ will come and Adam will make his report. At this council, Christ will be received and acknowledged as the rightful ruler of the earth. Satan will be replaced. Joseph Fielding Smith, uh, in another volume of his book, uh, his book says, Daniel speaks of Adam as the Ancient of Days. In this dispensation, the Ancient of Days will sit in the Valley of Adam on Diamond, and the judgment will be set. Christ will come and the kingdom will be turned over to Christ and he will be sustained in his calling as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's volume one, page 106, Doctrines of Salvation. In Mormon theology, the uh, doctrine about God is most succinctly stated in the Doctrine and Covenants. And the Doctrine and Covenants is regarded by Mormons as scripture, equivalent or even superior to the Bible. So you can't say that it's not an authoritative statement. And what it says there is that God the Father has a uh, 
tangible body of flesh and bones as tangible as uh, a body of flesh and bones as tangible as the sun, and that both of them are regarded as having physical bodies. The Mormon Church teaches that God the Father is an exalted man. He has a, a tangible body of flesh and bones, just like ours. Uh, we're created in His image, therefore He must look just like us according to the Mormon doctrine. And here again, I'll refer to the same book, Gospel Principles. Uh, this is basic Mormon doctrine. Virtually every Mormon knows this. Uh, when Joseph Smith had his first vision, he saw two people, two guys standing there. And uh, most Mormons will go to that when you ask them this question, but uh, what kind of a being is God? Because we are made in His image, we know that God has a body that looks like ours. His eternal spirit is housed in a tangible body of flesh and bones. In September of 2006, Henry Eyring, who's a Mormon apostle, was giving a talk. Uh, in a speech that he gave called Gifts of the Spirit for Hard Times, he said, I bear you my witness that God the Father lives, a glorified and exalted man. So the teaching is still there. For them, uh, matter itself is uh, a spiritual thing. Spirit is a matter, a material thing. They, they, uh, they regard, and Joseph Smith even taught in the Doctrine and Covenants, he says there's no such thing as immaterial matter. He said that all matter and spirit itself is matter, but it's a pure kind of matter that you know you can't see it with your normal eyes, but you will one day have a, a you know a glorified body, and you will be able to see that it is in fact actually matter. And uh, so, for Mormonism, um, God is an altogether corporeal being. Um, there's no such thing as a exalted God without or apart from his body. The idea that God is a glorified human was taught by Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith made it very clear that God himself was once as we are now and as an exalted man sits enthroned in yonder heavens. He lives near a star or a planet depending on which Mormon leader you listen to. It's been described both ways but a place called Kolob and uh, so they do believe that he is a human just like us. If, if, if Joseph Smith said God himself was once as we are now, well, what are we now? Obviously, we, we have skin, we have hair, we have fingers, we have toes, we have eyes, we have a mind to reason. Um, if, if those words have any meaning at all, you would have to draw the conclusion that God was once a human like us. There's no escaping that. Joseph Fielding Smith, also in his book, The Doctrines of Salvation, in volume 1, page 12, says, Let me ask, are we not taught that we as sons of God may become like him? Is not this a glorious thought? Yet we have to pass through mortality and receive the resurrection and then go on to perfection just as our Father did before us. The prophet taught that our Father had a Father, and so on. Is not this a reasonable thought, especially when we remember that the promises are made to us that we may become like him? If Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and John discovered that God, the Father of Jesus Christ, had a Father, you may suppose that he had a Father also. Where was there ever a son without a father? And where was there ever a father without first being a son? Hence, if Jesus had a father, cannot we believe that he had a father also? Jesus said that the father wrought precisely in the same way as his father had done before him. As the father had done before, he laid down his life and took it up the same as his father had done before. And so, according to Mormon doctrine, God the Father, physical being, uh, an exalted man who has uh, a physical body, um, also had a father. He was also a, a son to a father, just like Jesus Christ was, just like we were. And according to Mormon doctrine, this progress has been going on for all eternity. And Joseph Smith said that God and Father, the Father of Saul, once dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. And uh, we know how Jesus Christ himself dwelt on an earth here in this life. He was submitted to a Father God above him. And uh, yet Joseph Smith says that God the Father himself dwelt on another earth in the same manner. So that uh, doctrine, you know, by implication, and there's other places where he talks about it, um, 
but by implication right there you've got this idea that there's another God above the God that we worship. This, this is a main part of Mormonism. This is one of the foundational teachings of Mormonism today. To jettison that is to jettison Joseph Smith's credibility. He, he believed that God the Father was a a God in a long chain of gods. He was a descendant of another God who was a descendant of another. The, the problem, of course, for us as Christians is, is, is the, the God of the Bible is described as the God of gods at least five times. And it's not trying to imply that there's a plurality of gods, it's merely trying to get a point across that there's anything that you might believe could be a God let it be known that the God of the Bible is over it, whether real or imagined, and of course it's imagined. So the idea that God could have a father is just untenable to a Bible-believing Christian. We, we, we can never hold to that, and that certainly is one of the reasons why Christianity will not embrace Mormonism as a part of the Christian fold. The, the very concept of God himself is foreign to what we believe and foreign to what the Bible teaches. It's uh, really pretty, I think, disingenuous for Mr. Romney to suggest that belief in the flood is the most unusual thing about Mormonism. When I think of bizarre Mormon teachings, the flood does not come to mind. But what does come to mind is baptism for the dead. Jesus supposedly, sometime between his death and resurrection, descended to the place of the dead, organized missionary missionaries, missionary work, and sent them off to share the gospel in hopes that they might respond and, and have a second chance at becoming the part of the one true church, according to Mormonism. Uh, but one of the things that is necessary, according to Mormon doctrine, people might hear the gospel, might respond to the gospel, but they need, bapti they need to be baptized. That's just... I think Bruce McConkie says that is the gate. Baptism is the gate that sets you on the path to the celestial kingdom. It's essential for remission of sins according to Mormon doctrine. So baptism for the dead is essential. Well, spirits aren't going to get baptized. So in Mormon doctrine, people who are alive on this earth right now by proxy get baptized for people who are dead. Within Mormonism they teach that God the Father um, needed a wife in order to produce his spirit children. Uh, therefore, there is a heavenly father and a heavenly mother, uh, which the Bible speaks nothing of. Mormonism says that there are many, 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 many worlds out there inhabited by various gods. And so in the Mormon pantheon, there's a countless number of gods. And we are only on one of those planets where one of those gods is. Man is the child of God formed in the divine image and endowed with divine attributes. And even as the infant son of our earthly father and mother is capable in due time of becoming a man, so the undeveloped offspring of celestial parentage is, in, is capable by experience through eons and ages of evolving into a god. We're going to somehow uh, be having universes of our own, I mean it's a corruption of language, uh, but uh, universes of our own and, and still uh, governing worlds without number ourselves and, and still live in a family relationship in some central locale, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Mormonism actually teaches that Jesus and Satan are siblings. Jesus, Satan, and everybody else that exists were all brothers and sisters in the pre-existence. And
to me. I mean, that is just so bizarre, especially in light of the Bible's teaching on both of those characters. God went through celestial marriage, has an eternal wife. We're going to go through celestial marriage, have an eternal wife, and then we will become gods just like God, just like our Heavenly Father, and we will father our own worlds, and we will become the God of our own worlds and people will actually worship and pray to us like we worship and pray to our Heavenly Father. That's a very strange doctrine. That's, a, that's totally contrary to the Bible. Uh, something that I think is a dangerous doctrine to teach people, especially when the Bible teaches that the reason that Satan fell in the first place was that he desired to be like God. And Satan desiring to be like God, God cursed him. How could it be any different for a human being who desires to be like God? Um, in talking with Mormons, I have been taken back uh, by the fact that it is very hard, very difficult to get straightforward answers from those that I speak with. And so when, when people have asked me, you know, what, what, what has come as a shock to me being here in Utah now for a year and a half, uh, I always tell them that it, it's, it's, it's tough to talk with them. Number one, even just to get them to talk about spiritual things is a, is a challenge. And then, but if you do find some who are interested in talking about spiritual things, if you find a Mormon who's interested in talking about spiritual things, uh, there's... You, you'll get a variety of answers from any given Mormon. So there's no unity, it seems. There's no consistency amongst Mormons regarding their teachings, regarding their doctrine. I think there's a huge difference between Mormon folk doctrine, doctrine that the Mormon people want to tell you that their church teaches, and the official doctrines taught by the Mormon church. When I say their teaching, you have to understand there's a big difference, and usually a difference, between official church doctrine as the kind of statements we've just been looking at and what we might call Mormon folk doctrine. Uh, Mormons, many Mormons don't believe a lot of what is really official Mormon church doctrine. And they not only don't necessarily believe all of that doctrine, but they even believe quite a few things that are actually contrary to that, but are so established in the Mormon psyche, if you will, in the collective consciousness of, of Mormons, that it's become current. It's, it's, it's Mormon folk doctrine. It's not Christian. It's not Mormon official church doctrine, but it's still Mormon because it's like, you know, 90% or more of the population of the Mormon church would, would agree to it. In recent years, it appears to be more and more difficult to get Mormon people to own up to the doctrines of their church. The the strange doctrines, the different doctrines, the doctrines that are very unchristian. I don't think in the past it was nearly as difficult for them to own up to these doctrines, but now uh, in our political climate that we're living in today, it appears as though it's almost impossible to get Mormon people, especially in political positions, to own up to any of the different doctrines that their church teaches and believes in. Even when they're common doctrines of their church, they just don't seem to want to talk about them because they realize how different they are than the main beliefs of modern Christianity or any kind of Christianity. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge because it almost seems like you have to know, you know, what everybody has taught throughout the years regarding Mormonism because it seems like it's a, a religion that's evolving. <laughs> and so it just depends on, on where they fall into this, this spectrum of an evolving religion. Uh, and you have to know where they're at along that spectrum in order to be able to effectively communicate with them. It's much more difficult I see now. Uh, it's much more difficult to hear what I would consider very precise traditional Mormonism coming from the leadership. It's not that I think they're changing their views, they're just not emphasizing it like they used to because, in my opinion, they, they worship at the altar of public opinion. 
They're very concerned about what people think about them. They want very much to be accepted by the Christian community. Also the doctrines of God. Mormon people don't like to talk about the doctrines of God because they know how contrary the doctrines of God that they believe are to the, the doctrines of Christianity. Totally different. And they don't like to talk about them. They like to try to help you, try to make you think that we believe in exactly the same God and it's totally, di totally a different God. Anybody who's really studied Mormon history and studied how the Mormon leaders portray their church, they know they're covering things up. They know that there's one message for the general public and there's another message for the people. I know this, I've been studying it for three decades. I've, been, I've seen it for 30 some years and there's no denying this. They're not honest about what they believe. I think there are two sets of doctrine in the LDS Church. I've been a missionary, I know it, um, and I, there is a, a desire by, uh, I think, church membership overall to fit in to the general mold of Christianity. Um, and that said, I think I kind of call it this, I call it deep doctrine and missionary doctrine. If missionaries walk up to somebody on the street, the message they're going to present is, yes, we believe in God. Uh, we believe in one God, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in articles of faith, you know. Um, and basically, the things I'm going to state, you're going to bear no conflict with, as you know, whether you're Baptist, Catholic, every, you know, I'm going to make some general beliefs like that. Um, but when you really get into it, our beliefs are very different than Christians, and I think that's where... Uh, you get some conflict when I've sat in the same room before with some of the students from Biola and that, you know, and pe I've listened to people debate back and forth trying to mesh Mormonism into the Bible, trying to mesh the Bible into Mormonism and, and somehow try to form a union between these two religions, but they're two religions for a reason, they're different, you know. You guys are you know, mono, you know, monotheism, you believe in the Trinity, you believe in the Bible as the one word of God, and that's the end of it. You know, Mormonism believe in polytheistic, polygamy, um, continued revelation. The Bible is not the one word of God. Um, so, so many differences that are key, pivotal differences. And really, I think the only similarities that do exist are some common names and terms that we use, things like Jesus Christ, Holy Bible. But even our definitions of those things at the core are completely different, you know. And so, yeah, I definitely think that they're, from the church's standpoint, in hopes to gain converts, um, yeah, there, there is some, uh, what's the word? Uh, I don't think that they're as clear as they always should be about doctrine. The idea of actually voting for a Mormon, I mean, think about it, you're a Christian living in Utah. And in a general election in Utah, that's all you have. So if you were going to say just a, just whole hog, there's no way that you can vote for a Mormon. You've really just just disenfranchised every Bible-believing Christian living in the state of Utah. Look inside the Scripture, and there's two key passages: Romans 13 and 1 Peter chapter 3 that deal with government. And I think it, it's it's very important that we as Christians recognize that Romans 13 teaches that government is an ordained institution of God. It has its own specific purpose that God has ordained for government to fulfill. I like Romans 13 and I think it helps us to establish at least a couple of, of key criteria in which to evaluate candidates by. And uh, first of all, you'll note in that passage if you looked at it that it uses this phrase, minister of God. It uses it I think on three different occasions. Now that is key because even though this is an ordained institution, the people that hold office, the people that are part of government, are called by God ministers of God. And I think that establishes for us a very key criteria, that ministers of God, even in the capacity of government, should be people of character. So when we're looking to evaluate a candidate, we need to look at their character. But secondly, it gives us the specific purpose that God has ordained the institution of government for. And it says that, that of course, all authorities come from God. There is no authority that is, exists that wasn't established by God. And the government, it says in Romans 13, exists to do away with evil. 
the, it says that it's to, to bring about wrath on those that practice evil. So that tells me that the minister of God, the person that's going to occupy the place of government, any, any, any chair in government, should have a good understanding of what constitutes evil. And I think he, basically, a good principle to evaluate is, is his agenda, is, are the views of, the, of the, the prospective candidate consistent with the revealed will of God. It makes me wonder if we had a person in a prominent place, a political position in leadership, and polygamy became an issue of any kind, what direction he might sway the country to go. I think that's dangerous, I think that's scary. The idea of the Constitution hanging by a thread, well, primarily the Constitution is guarded by the Supreme Court, and I admit the Supreme Court sometimes seems to come down with some decisions that probably trouble a lot of us as conservatives, but think about it this way, if you had a Mormon president, do you, what do you think the odds are that a Mormon president would be able to suggest that a Mormon be considered for a Supreme Court position? Probably not likely. So I think, in essence, a Mormon president would almost prevent that from happening. I think a Mormon president would probably very guard, be very guarded as to what he's going to try to accomplish as a Mormon. I don't really see much difference between their desire to want to go to Washington to get our country back to the founding document that runs this nation. I don't see their motivation being a whole lot different than many evangelical Christians. It may be a little bit tweaked, a little bit different, but I don't see too many of them run, running for office now with the idea that someday they're going to be running the country, you know, that it's going to be a Mormon theocracy. I don't, I'm not getting that impression from a lot of candidates that I see in modern times. Maybe before, for instance, when Joseph Smith ran for president in 1844, but I don't really see so much of that now. Because we have uh, and it, it's a scriptural thought, um, a scriptural teaching. There is a separation between church and state, between God's ordained institution of government and His ordained institution of the church. There is a, a clearly a separation there that God has established between church and state. And I think in America, more than any other country, uh, we typically we tend to hold. Uh, very strongly to that. And so even if there was a professing Christian, a, somebody who practiced uh, Mormonism, who, got in, who, who was running for office, would that preclude the Christian from, from voting for somebody else that didn't hold the same beliefs, that they were not Christian? Say, say, the, say the gentleman was Mormon and he was running for president. Would it be okay knowing that the Mormon holds to totally different, has a totally different belief system than the Christian? Would would it be okay for the Christian to vote for the Mormon? And again, uh, even, if, and even if you use the, the two criteria that I have established in Romans 13 as far as character and consistent with the revealed will of God, in our country people do not get away with pushing a religious agenda for the most part. And so uh, I, don't, I don't think it would have an impact on our country and I don't think it would be wrong for a Christian to vote for somebody else that's of a another religious bent whether it be a Catholic or whether it be a Mormon uh, just because they are not going to be able to promote their religious beliefs anyway a lot of Mormons do hold to a lot of the social things that we that we would hold to uh, they're very conservative many times in a lot of their beliefs when it comes to family values when it comes to the subject of homosexuality, for instance, we would probably share a lot of views in that. If, if it came to choosing between somebody who is a member of what I consider a cult, I think that it would be dangerous to vote for that person. And that's what I believe. I, I mean, it, <laughs> for me, it's, it's hard to, I mean, yeah, he holds a lot of our values, but man.
to think of putting him in office in a position of that kind of leadership when he would be exalted by his cult as a huge religious person. Uh, I think that's a problem for me. One of the concerns I have, well, I have a number of concerns uh, of Mormons being in power. One is, is I firmly believe that whoever is running this country needs spiritual power, not just intellectual wisdom. You have a Mormon president, where is he going to turn for spiritual advice? You know, the thought of a Mormon president turning to someone like a Thomas Monson or a Boyd Packer, quite frankly, is very disconcerting to me. <laughs> Uh, I, would, I would like to see a, a Christian in there who can turn to godly men to give good counsel. But there are some aspects of Mormonism uh, that many Americans might not understand. The belief that uh, Jesus Christ will appear again in the state of Missouri. Um, or that God has a material body, that he was fathered by another God. Are these legitimate issues for people to, to, to ask you about? Well, there's a, there's a leap of faith associated with every religion. You, have, you haven't exactly got those doctrines right, but if you have doctrines you want to talk about, go talk to the church, because okay. that's not my job. But uh, the most unusual thing in my church is that we believe there was once a flood upon the earth and that a man took a boat and put two of each animal inside the boat and, and to save humanity by doing that. Look, they're unusual. We're familiar with they're, 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 un they're unusual beliefs associated with each faith, and I'm, I'm proud of, of my faith and happy to talk to people about it. 